And it's very rare that a patient has a seizure that lasts too long. It's, it's more typical to have a patient have difficulty to have a seizure. And when you're talking about a seizure, the patient is asleep and their muscles are totally relaxed. So you don't see a, the whole body move. It's just the brain is seizing and we can pick that up through our electrodes, which I'll show you in a second. So it's really kind of a, if you will, not a boring treat, you know, I take medical students to go watch it with me and they thought, oh, that's not, that's it, this is nothing. So it it's uh, not as um, scary or intense as it may sound or what you've seen in movies like One Flew Over the Cuckoo to Nest or other movies that depict ECT um, are more sensational, which it is not. So where do we put the electrodes on the head to induce a seizure? There's a couple of different placements. You can start with unilateral uh, electrode placement. And we use the right hemisphere basically because that's the non-dominant language hemisphere. So we don't wanna, um, you know, we wanna do the less, less uh, involvement of the language hemisphere. We also can use bilateral treatment. We can use bitemporal on both temporals or bifrontal treatment. This slide, the next slide shows on the right-hand side there, that is the, it's called the DeAlea placement. It's basically the right uh, unilateral electrode placement. Um, the right unilateral electrode placement tends to have less memory side effects. So we usually start with that. Uh, some patients will need to progress to bi bilateral treatment. And on the left-hand side there, that's basically showing some of the monitoring electrodes. We monitor both the brain seizing, uh, so we have EEG electrodes, and then we will use the foot to monitor a motor seizure, an EMG monitor. We'll use a tourniquet on the leg before the succinylcholine or the paralytic or muscle relaxer goes in so we can actually see the toe move during the seizure just in case our EEG leads fail. These, this is basically what prints out of the machine that I can see the top two there are the brain having a seizure and the third line there is the foot having a seizure. So the, the, um, there's a great um, uh, video that I show patients. It's called the Dartmouth-Hitchcock ECT video. And it's a video that came out of Dartmouth College that talks about the indications for ECT, talks about the side effects for ECT, and then goes through... Um, several patients who have had ECT and talks about what their response to it is, what they thought about it. And it also shows somebody getting an ECT treatment. So it's a fantastic video. I think it was made, um, I think they were sued from by somebody who had memory impairment from electroconvulsive therapy. And so part of their settlement was to make this video. But it's a fantastic video, and I show it to all, all my patients and the families before people undergo electroconvulsive therapy. Um, I have a couple more slides about the history of ECT, but I really um, kind of want to get Lori Robinson in to talk about her experience, and then we can open up for questions if there are any. Thank you. You'll have to excuse me if my voice is um, raspy. I've had a cold for a while, but I started ECT, I think the first time was probably in, let me think, 1999? Ooh, my gosh. Um, but I had several series, and because I didn't have anything immediately after the series, I would have to go back and get a new series. But Dr. Gunther realized that, well, we'll do this series and then we'll have you come back for maintenance treatment. I think it started off like every three weeks. And um, 
that worked very well. And when I would be able to space out the maintenance treatments to like every six weeks for a few times, then we would stop. But I also knew that if I needed to come back, I could. I was very suicidal. Um, I actually made an attempt while on One West, which is the uh, psych ward at um, VA in Tucson. I had other attempts outside of the hospital as well. But the ECT, yes, it does have an effect on your memory. I did get severe headaches. Um, I have a not the best reaction to anesthesia as far as coming out of it, but the anesthesia itself didn't make me sick or anything. Um, I, I highly recommend it. I was treatment resistant. I can't tell you how many medications I tried. Um, I tried biofeedback. I tried um, EMDR, which is eye movement desensitization reprocessing. I tried a lot of different therapy techniques like um, dialectical behavioral therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, cognitive processing therapy. I, I, whatever it was, I, I had tried it. And my therapist suggested that I research ECT. And of course, Dr. Gunther said the first thing came to mind was one flew over the cuckoo's nest. <laughs> it's like, no. So I had to do some research online. And fortunately, there were several articles on the benefits and risks of ECT. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I thought, okay, I'll, I'll give this a try. And it just, it, I, I can't explain the difference. It was like night and day. I, I got my life back, basically, or was given a life. I'm not sure how to put that. Um, it's, I guess, like any procedure, it has its risks, but they're, for me, they were well worth taking. Um, as with any treatment, I think you have to be willing to try something new um, and put yourself out there. For me, I, I was like at my wit's end. Nothing was working. Um, to me, um, suicide was the only answer. So I'm here because of ECT, to be honest. it's It just was really a, a lifesaver, truly. Thank you, Lori. And, um, you know, there are a lot of uh, patients who are interested in ECT. And if you if you know patients or if you think about clients or patients that may benefit from the treatment, um, you know, have them talk to their provider. It is electric convulsive therapy is offered throughout the state. We, you know, several hospitals in the Tucson area. Um, provide at several hospitals in the Phoenix area, and even the I know Flagstaff Medical Center as well does um, electroconvulsive therapy. So it's a pretty standard standardized treatment. Um, so there are lots of places that offer it. I would say. Um, I add one more thing, Dr. Gunther. Mm -hmm. Everybody reacts. I live in Prescott, so I had to drive down to Tucson for my treatment. So I would drive down. The day before <clears throat> I get my treatment the following day and leave the day after treatment. But I had been there where people that live in the Tucson area have their a friend or spouse, whatever, take them to the treatment. And I've watched them walk out of the recovery room <laughs> yeah. and go home. So everybody's different on, on what type of recovery they need, I guess is the best way to put it. Very good. That's a great point, Lori, in that electric muscle therapy is a mostly an outpatient treatment. Patients, you know, uh, come in just like an ambulatory surgery, nothing to eat the night before, come into the pack, you get their treatment and go home. Uh, people who we yeah, usually have stay overnight are people who come from afar, like you did, Lori, 
for people who are so sick, they need to be in the hospital if they're, you know, psychotic or suicidal, that they're, they already need to be in the hospital because of those sorts of symptoms. Um, it is the, the other, the other, um, I guess, instructions that we give people who have ECT is they cannot drive for 20, at least 24 hours after the treatment um, because of the memory impairment and the effects of the anesthesia. But other than that, I have people who will get their treatment, recover, and get so driven to work the next day. So it's, it's um, something that is done quite frequently as an outpatient and not too disruptive in people's lives. Now, there are other treatments for depression. I think some of the other breakout series are um, talking about uh, RTMS, or repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation and ketamine. And some of those treatments are as well uh, outpatient treatments for refractory depression. Right. I guess, Michael, are there any questions or shall I finish up with the slides? So we can take a brief pause now, doctor, if you would like. Um, if anyone in the audience has any questions, feel free to ask. I know there was a lot of great information that Dr. Gunther just went over. Okay, I guess we'll keep going, doctor. Okay, sounds good. Let me just bring, try and bring my slides back up. Goodness gracious. Okay. Oh, okay. So this is just a little bit of the history of electroconvulsive therapy. Um, I used to hate it when in lectures when people would talk about the history of this and the history of that. But the history of electroconvulsive therapy is fascinating. And um, if you think about it, when it was occurring, like in the early 1900s, <clears throat> there were no treatments for psych for uh, psychiatric illness, no medication or other treatments for psychiatric illness, which is, of course, the mainstay pharmacologic treatment is now the mainstay treatment of um, of uh, mental illness, basically. So it's it's just kind of fascinating. I think that's part of the reason why electric and walls of therapy was, um, you know, has a really bad reputation is that some of the techniques that were initially used and that it was used on everybody, because again, there were no other treatments for psychiatric illness at the time. Uh, anyway, the way it kind of came about is that these, <clears throat> in Europe, people, a couple of um, um, people or, scientists theorized that there was an inverse relationship between um, epilepsy and schizophrenia. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what they noticed when people, after they had an epileptic seizure, their mood would improve, their psychotic symptoms would improve. And so they thought, why don't we induce seizures in patients with schizophrenia and see if they get better? And so they they started using medications that would induce seizures that were not very pleasant, you know, medications. Um, and then these Italian uh, scientists started using electricity to induce seizures in the light, late 1930s. And again, at this time, patients were completely awake and not paralyzed in the least. So can you imagine how frightening that would be to know that you're about to get have a seizure when they put these electrodes on you? It's, it's horrible to think about now. But they did a treatment. They published a paper that this patient with schizophrenia was cured after 12 electroshock treatments. And um, ECT, again, kind of spread rapidly throughout the world, including the United States in the 30s and 40s. Um, and then in 1941, uh, somebody <laughs> invented an electroconvulsive uh, therapy machine in Australia. It was like the first one made. 
and um, it really didn't go anywhere because World War II was occurring, and so they didn't really get to to ship this machine or get to show it anywhere, which is an interesting historical fact. Um, again, people were, were not using any kind of anesthetic at this time. Um, so unmodified ECT, that's considered no, you know, no anesthetic or no muscle relaxers. And that was, that basically happened up and through the 1950s in the United States. Again, you can see why ECT is not well liked um, in that if you knew, if you had a relative or something or somebody that went through it, and at that time they were usually put in a state hospital by their husband or whatever and underwent this treatment without any kind of, uh, with, you know, being wide awake and not paralyzed. So it was, it was pretty horrific. That being said, it's still, it was helpful for people's moods and psychotic symptoms. And unmodified ECT was, has been used in some countries up until relatively recently. So even in the 90s in, in China and in some of the biggest hospitals, they would use ECT uh, without, um, in this unmodified version. So again, some of the early controversial areas is that electricity was used for torture and aversion therapy to kind of cure people from being gay or whatever. Uh, so ECT kind of got um, allied with that, um, which was not true. The, at the time when you did not use um, paralytic or, or uh, anesthetic agents, you could have must, uh, bones could be broken during the treatment. And then at this time is when psychoanalysis really kind of came into um, favor and was the, the predominant treatment um, at that time. Again, this is all before medication. Um, there are some, some groups now that are still very uh, anti-psychiatric treatment and anti- um, medication, anti-ECT, and then the, what comes to mind are Scientologists. They have a really strong um, stance against any kind of psychiatric treatment, which I think is can be detrimental to, and you know, people obviously. Um, and then again, some of these uh, misconceptions about the treatment itself. So I, even some states today require um, a lot of um, basically to go to court, to e even if you want to get ECT voluntarily. So it's still quite misunderstood. And, you know, my goal, part of my goal of my career, I guess, is to um, educate people about not only ECT, but other treatments, psychopharmacologic treatments and other treatments to um release or to decrease the burden of symptoms of psychiatric illness. I mean, if you think about it, everybody should have a, have a mental health provider, right? Kids should, it should be normalized. You have a primary care doctor, why not in elementary school start having a therapist or a school counselor that you talk to about your feelings? I think if we could normalize and, and start talking about um, mental health and, uh, you know, at an early age and, and make it more part of our um, culture, you know, so it would just help things in the long run. That's my, <laughs> my soapbox and I will get off it. I know I think we're, we're stopping a little early, so I'm, I apologize for that, but hopefully you guys can have a nice break.